Good morning. What a blessed day to worship the Lord. And hope as you get settled in that you're here with a heart that's open to what he has for you this morning. Because if you came with an expectant heart, you're going to be filled. We're in Ezekiel 37, and we get to see dry bones come alive today. And um, we're going to sing about that, and we are going to look into God's Word. And not just the Old Testament, because God, God's going to be throughout, throughout His Word, and we're going to be in His Word throughout Old and New Testament. By the way, I was just informed that there is a Chrysler Pacifica don't know the color that's out here on the street that's running and nobody in it. So don't know if that is. <laughs> We're not going to mention any names. <laughs> and all of us, all the rest of us are saying, boy, I'm sure glad it wasn't me. <laughs> Yeah, she's just getting a drink of water. Thanks, Becky. Yeah. Oh, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? So let's take a deep breath. Ask God to fill us up with what he has for us this week. Let's worship. Uh, I, I heard your horses are out, so you better get going and take care of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let's hey, we serve an amazing, powerful God. Let's stand together and give him just um, all the worship we got. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
Tasted and seen of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. In your prayer. Yeah. 
Thank you that we get to be here together to worship you and to praise your name. We gather together and we lift our hearts to you. We lift our praise to you, Jesus. We thank you that you are the risen Savior, our Redeemer, and our friend. Lord, thank you for the blood that brings us into fellowship with God the Father, that we have righteousness only in you. Lord, thank you that though our sin is great, your love is greater. Thank you that you are the God of the universe and that you hold everything in your hand, that you're sovereign and you are good, and that we can trust you with every little thing in our lives that seems overwhelming, that we can give you glory for all of the, the joy and the happiness and the good that you pour on us, but we can also give you glory as we suffer and as we go through trials, Lord, it's for your glory. And we give you glory and honor this morning. Lord, thank you that your word is alive, that it's active, that it meets us right where we are. Lord, we thank you that your spirit lives in us. And that through your spirit, you reveal truth to us. And so we look to that truth this morning in your word. And we pray that you would breathe new life into us. That you would awaken us and that you would open our eyes to see the things that we need to move in, that we need to change, ways that we need to step out in faith and allow you to use us as your vessels. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. If you were thinking of coming to church next Saturday night, there will not be here, there, we will not be having church next Saturday night, but we will be having church over on the coast. So um, if you want to come on over there, I think Spencer Davenport is going to be one of our speakers, and Jake Whitmire will be one of our speakers. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the coast. God of the impossible. It's what the angel Gabriel told Mary, that nothing would be impossible with God. 
whether it's hearing God from a burning bush or the quiet promptings of the Holy Spirit, having the walls of the ocean stand up and given passage, or maybe where you have opportunity to share the gospel with a neighbor, being led by a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, or the Holy Spirit within you saying, this is the way to go. Go, go in this. Or in Mary's case, being a virgin, yet delivering the Son of God. Nothing is impossible with God. I think we create impossibilities. We know that nothing is impossible with God. Becky and I were talking last night and this morning about what we thought some of our impossible circumstances seem to be. And we became overwhelmed by some of them because we were trying to figure a way out. But sometimes we look at the circumstances instead of our God. We know, church, that he's a God of the impossible. We know it generally but yet we struggle with it specifically, I think, within our own each unique, diverse circumstances. And that doubt can lead to despair and to hopelessness. And if you've read through Ezekiel 37, well, then you know that the people of Israel, they were in captivity and their circumstances seemed hopeless. So how about you? Have you ever felt hopeless about some of your circumstances? Maybe with your family, maybe with your job, maybe with your friends, maybe it's your marriage. Whatever your hopeless circumstance, I'd like you to give it to Jesus this morning. Keep asking, keep praying. Because when we look at our circumstances like like David did, as we're going to see later on here, everything looked hopeless for David. He was overwhelmed. He didn't know if there was going to be a way out until he prayed and he looked up. In Ezekiel 37, Israel feels hopeless. Let me just give you a glimpse of where we're going there. If you'll open your Bibles to Ezekiel 37, I want to read verse, verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. They have been in captivity now, we know, for 12 years, according to chapter 33, verse 21. Jerusalem has fallen. The temple has been destroyed so many lives have been killed, and the people that are living in captivity is, have lost hope. If you put yourself in their circumstances, if you had loved ones that had died and you were being held captive against your will, you might not see a way out either. You might, it, might seem, it might seem hopeless. But then there again, we need to know that we serve a God of the impossible. I'm sure somewhere down in their being, they remembered the miracles of old and that God could do them again. And we believe that, at least we know that, but do we really believe it with our circumstances? That's what Becky and I talked about last night. Okay, here's these circumstances. They seem overwhelming. But is God big enough? Is God great enough to touch lives here? How about you? Do you have overwhelming circumstances and there seems no way out? Maybe you've prayed 
for family members for years, but you haven't seen results. So what do you do? I think we keep believing. I think we keep praying. Let's start going through chapter 37, verses 1 and 3. As I told the folks that were here last night, this verse just really stuck, struck me and it spoke to my heart because I knew that I was going to be bringing God's word to you this morning to last night. And I don't know if you've ever prayed this, but, but I found myself this past week praying it. And if you never have, I would encourage you to do so. It starts off by saying, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And I can't think of any greater thing than to have the hand of the Lord upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass among them around about. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, you know. There is an old spiritual um, that's known as Dem Bones. You remember the song, Dem Bones and Bones. Well, that song was used to teach basic anatomy to our children, but it was actually taken from Ezekiel 37. And one of the last songs that we sang this morning was taken from Ezekiel 37. As we were driving down the road yesterday, um, Becky was uh, playing to me the backstory to this song and how it was written by a mother who had a son that was a prodigal and had gone astray and spiritually his bones had become just dried out. And she prayed for dry bones. And if you're here this morning and you've given your life to the Lord, but you just kind of came dried out and feeling dead inside, well, then you're in the right place. And we can see what was going to happen to the nation of Israel, specifically because that's who this was written to. But I think there's also a message. I don't think I know that there's a message here for us as well. So Ezekiel, he is given this vision. And I think I would have responded like Ezekiel in verse 3, where he's seeing all this, and he says in verse 3, Lord, Lord, you know. And remember, they're in captivity, and Moses has tried to tell the people that if they didn't keep God's commandments, that this day would come. And as I see where the nation of Israel has been taken and they're in captivity because they haven't been keeping the word of the Lord. And I know this prophecy is to Israel, but it makes me think about our own country that is so divided today and how far we have drifted from the word of the Lord. Now the question is asked in verse 3, can these bones live? And it's not a question of power if God can do something, but I think it's a question of if God is willing and if it's his will. And we know from Romans chapter 4, verse 17, it says, God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which doesn't exist. Think about that. A God that gives life to the dead and calls into being that which doesn't exist. Now, take your impossible situation. And I don't think, I don't think that I'm the only one in the world that's ever had an impossible situation. Take your impossible situation and give it to the Lord. Because we all have them. 
Let's go on in our study, reading verse 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. If Ezekiel had any question or hesitation about what's just happened to him, they're not recorded here. But I know me personally, if this had happened to me or if it happened to you, you might have, you might have questions as well. I would have probably said, Lord, you, you want me to what? And then the scripture goes on in verses 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, that you may come to life, and I will put sinew on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, that you may come alive. And you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came back together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, sinew was on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Well, as Ezekiel prophesied, the bones started to come together. We read in verse 4, and notice clear, clearly how they started to come together. The Bible says it was by the word of the Lord. But it says clearly that there was no breath in them. And as I got thinking in my office about that last night, the breath is what gives life. And there's physical life, but we know there's also spiritual life. But remember, it goes back to Genesis 2-7, where the Bible says God breathed into Adam. And he became a life-giving spirit. Revival can't take place. Nothing spiritually alive can take place without the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that in verse 14. First, you see the bones started coming back together by the word of the Lord, verse 4. But then... But then you see life, or we're going to see it in verse 14, but let's wait till we get there and go on to verses 9 and 10. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds or, or from every part of the world, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they came to life, to life, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. You know, as I was, as we were singing that last song this morning, and they came to life, an exceedingly great army. It made me think of us as a church. And you who are here in the army that God wants to raise up here to move within the city that we work. But before we can be that army, we need to come to life, spiritually speaking. And some of you may have come with dry bones or a dry spirit this morning. You're a believer. You're not going anyplace. So I want you to think about where you're spiritually at and if you're willing to be a part of God's army that, that can make a difference for the kingdom. Ezekiel saw some ama amazing things, but what about us? What are we seeing God do in our lives because we believe in him and because we're trying to obey him? Let's ask the Holy Spirit of God to breathe afresh on us. I was telling the congregation last night that Timothy, we know, was a pastor in the city of Ephesus. And being a pastor isn't, it's not real easy at times, but Timothy started to get dried out. So Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 6, he said, hey, Timothy, 
Kindle afresh the gift of God. Make it new. Make it alive. Don't get dried out. Kindle afresh. And I think we need to do that, church, if we're to be the witnesses to the city where God has put us. Bringing dry bones into the valley to life was going to be a two-part process for Ezekiel, involving both the word of God that we saw in verse 4, but then also the spirit. The word, because it's alive, we're told from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that, and Becky mentioned this in her closing prayer this morning, but that the word of God is alive. It is. It speaks to all generations. It has authority. I personally believe, and I, I hope that you do as well, that it's the inspired word of God, that it's the inerrant word of God. It speaks. It still speaks. So Ezekiel was told to use the word, but then we, we read that life also comes through the Spirit. Because God, we are reborn. Remember the talk that Jesus had with Nicodemus. He was a religious leader, and he knew all about God, but he didn't really know God down here. And so Nicodemus told, or Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 5, Nicodemus, he said, you can't just be born of water, which is a physical birth. You have to be born. I seem to be cutting out a little bit. Ezekiel's role was to prophesy. That was his part. God's role was to produce the results. It's the same with us. Our responsibility is to prophesy. Or I was telling, again, folks last night, there's two kinds of prophecy. There's a prophecy of foretelling the future, but there's also a prophecy of just declaring the word of God. And that's what the Lord wants us to be a part of as his army is sharing his message. And then leaving the results up to God. God is the one that brings life from death. He does it through the word. He does it by his spirit. And now we're going to see that in verses 11 through 14. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. Our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. If you came to church this morning overwhelmed by your circumstances or feeling hopeless, well, this message is, it's a message for you. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I... Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come out of your graves, O people. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you in your own land. This has already happened today. I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord God. This prophecy has a two-part prophecy, I believe. The first part came when Israel was brought back into their own land in 1948 after World War II, after which some six million Jews were slaughtered in the Holocaust. But out of that travesty, the Lord began to work. And the heart of the world became sympathetic. And a home was carved out of the Middle East for the Jews. But spiritually, many of the hearts of the Jews still today, they're like these dry bones. and They're dead. But one day the Spirit of God is going to move 
in the hearts of the Jewish people. We have this promise from the book of Romans, chapter 11, 25 through 27. It says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, but a partial hardening has happened to Israel. We're, we're seeing that until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. We're part of that fullness of the Gentiles that is coming in even today. Verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion, speaking of the Christ. And he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant I will make with them when I take away their sin. So I've been asking you to get real with yourself. You ever feel spiritually dried out and hopeless? Then ask the spirit of the living God to breathe fresh on you and prophesy. That is, give the scriptures to those around you that seem dried out and dead because we all have neighbors that are like that. So many people, neighborhoods, cities, and states today look like this valley of dry bones. I'm sure you would agree with me. So Ezekiel prophesied God's word to Israel. And we know that the scripture, it won't return void. There will be an impact when you share the word of God. But you know what? It has to impact us first. You see, if this passage of Scripture didn't impact my heart and I didn't check my spiritual pulse to see if I've become dried out, well, it's not going to impact you. So what I'm asking you to do this morning is to let the Holy Spirit of God, ask the Holy Spirit of God to search your heart to see if you've become spiritually dried out. Because if you're spiritually dead, you can't really have an impact on others that are spiritually dead. And once it impacts your own life, then prophesy, church, to the dry bones that are around you. Because when the fullness of the Gentiles has all come in and is complete, as we just read in Romans, well, I believe the Lord's going to come for his church. And I know we're all looking for that day. Now, in verses 15 through 23, I'm not going to take the time to read those verses, but I want to talk to you about them. And you have your Bibles right in front of you. There's an object lesson that's given here within these verses. An object lesson of two sticks. You see it right in verse 16 there. And the two sticks represent a divided nation. It represents Israel and Judah. And remember, Israel and Judah had been one country up until the, the end of the reign of Solomon. And after his reign, the kingdom became divided into Israel and and Judah, and they've been separated now for a long time. But what this, what, what this object lesson is telling us is that after the captivity, after this 70 years, they would have close to 40 more years of captivity. But after captivity, the Lord was going to unite them and bring them back into one nation, together in unity. Remember, Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be one as he and the Father are one. We know that the Trinity does it together. And church, the Lord wants us to do it together. Jesus said that our love for one another, which I believe is going to unify us, that love would identify us as his disciples. 
I think we would all agree this morning that we have never seen our nation, never in my lifetime, have we seen our nation so divided. I was talking to a dear friend this morning that got a few years on me, and he was saying, in my lifetime, Dick, I've never seen it so divided. And he talked about a time, Russ did, when people could leave their doors always open. When a truck, you could go into town and you didn't have to lock it. I think we would all agree that we have become a divided country and there's those that would seek to divide us farther. The scripture makes very clear that wherever you're from, whatever your race, whatever your nationality, that we've all been made in the image of God. And I believe the Lord would have us love one another. And that may sound pretty simple, but it is. God was going to bring Israel back to one nation. Let's be part of that army that God wants to breathe life into, that will bring unity into our city. Jesus said much about a house that was divided against itself. He said it would fall. It doesn't matter whether it's a house, whether it's a home, or whether it's a country. Let's be part of the healing. The unity for our country. Let's, uh, let's close by reading verses 24 through 29. Great verses. My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. What I'd like you to do if you have your Bibles open, or even if you're following me in your, your, with your phone, um, underline there, one shepherd. Verse 25, they will live on their own land that I gave Jacob my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. Underline the word prince. I will make a covenant of peace with them, and they will have an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. All the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. This one shepherd is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. When he came, Jesus was born of the line of David. We read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and Luke 1, 32. This one shepherd, verse 24, would be prince among them, verse 25, the prince of peace, who would be none other than the promised Messiah. The world that you and I are living today, it's a death valley. It's full of dead people. They talk about being alive, but you know what? I think they're zombies. The scripture even says that they're dead people. It says they're dead in their trespasses, that they have no spiritual life. Listen to what the Bible calls people without the Christ. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, 1 through 10, it makes very clear what people are like without the spirit of the living God living within them. And, and by the way, I was one of those people 
We were all one of those people who we were without Christ. The scripture says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, that would be, that would be Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches, richness of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. Through the cross of Christ, we are brought back to God, but we're also brought back to one another. God is working to bring all of us together to serve one prince. You know, when you think about it, and you've probably heard it before, but there's only two kinds of people in this world. There's alive people, and there's dead people. Jesus said in John 3, 36, He that believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. That means the person without the Son of God, they're dead inside. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, a follower of Christ, you know what you're like? You're like these dead, dry bones. That's what the Scripture is telling us from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So hear the word of the Lord. You can come to life by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the application that we can draw from Ezekiel 37. But the subject, the subject of the prophecy is to the nation of Israel. Back in the early 80s, I got a call one night, it's one of those calls that you just never forget. It was between 11 and 12 at night. It was a woman that went to this church. She was scared, and she said her and her husband needed help. Well, I, I left. I got there and knocked at the door. A man I had never met before threw open the door and put a shotgun right to my face within probably a foot. Um, I really didn't want to frighten him further, so I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't move, but my eyes were darting. And inside his house, I noticed a wood stove. It was, it was winter. And I didn't really know what to say, so I said, what kind of wood stove is that? And he told me, and then I asked what kind of wood he was burning, because I had a wood stove, and I was... I guess trying to draw some kind of any kind of bond I could with this guy. And he told me the wood that he was burning, but then he did something. He took the shotgun from his shoulder and he lowered it a little bit. So it was still on me, but but it was a sign. <laughs> and I took it as a good sign. And I asked him if I could come into his house. And he told me, he told me that I could. And when I did, he put his shotgun down and he started talking about his marriage and how his marriage was on the rocks and he was losing everything. He was struggling in his life and how everything felt hopeless. And when I read Ezekiel 37, 
it made me think about this man that night and how he looked inside like this valley of dry bones and that he was dead in the trespasses of his own sin. So I brought him the word of the Lord to his dry, dead bones, and I pointed him to Jesus, who causes us, the Bible says, to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As Christians, we have incredible hope that those that are walking around out there with, without Christ don't have. Because the scripture is made clear in Ephesians 2, 1, that they're dead in the trespasses of their sins. But sometimes the circumstances of life get in the way. Even as Christians, we start feeling beat up, overwhelmed, and dried out inside. And we start questioning, is God really the God of the impossible? I know he is, generally speaking, over here. But can that affect my circumstances and where I'm at and what I'm going through? If you're dried out, if you feel dead this morning, I would have you do two things. First, go to the word of the Lord. I was telling Dick and some of you that, that David, it's in Psalms chapter 13, when David was feeling overwhelmed, dried out, and really wondering if God was a God of the impossible and if he could help him with his situation or not. Let me take you to where David went. It's only six verses but uh, I believe it'll speak to your heart. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. And if you're dealing with something and you don't know, you don't know how long you can go on or if God really answers prayer, this is where this man after the heart of God went. But, you know, one of the things I love about David is he's just so brutally honest. And uh, he shares his own life, and this is what he says, and this is where he went. I'm in Psalms 13. I'm reading verses 1 through 6. He cries out, how, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? You ever felt that way? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes or I sleep the sleep of death. And my enemies will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. Now notice, notice the turn. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. David got his eyes off his own circumstances. He looked up and he started trusting in God's loving kindness, regardless of what he was going through. He started to rejoice in his salvation, his eternal life. By the way, eternal life starts when you give your life to the Lord. It doesn't start when you get to heaven. If you've given your life to the Lord, if you've said, I believe, save me from my sin, you have eternal life. The Holy Spirit of God is living within you. And I'm here to remind you that he is a God of the impossible. So David went from, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever, to verse 6, I will sing to the Lord. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. His perspective went from this narrow to this big. And he saw who was really in control. David knew where to go when he was overwhelmed.
Go to the word of the Lord. Second, ask the Spirit. The Spirit of the living God, verse 14 from Ezekiel chapter 37, to breathe afresh on you. Ask Him to fill you. When you give your life to the Lord, salvation, it happens. It happens instantaneously. But we don't become like Jesus that split second. That is a process. And I believe the scripture teaches that during that process, there are, there are many fillings and renewings of the spirit. We see that from Ephesians 5.18, where you get the command of the apostles. To be filled with the Spirit. Or as Paul told Timothy, kindle afresh the gift of God that's within you. Don't stay in that dried out state. You can't be effective there. We're to be an army that God wants to raise up to make a difference where we live. Our hope can't be in the things of this world. The things that are seen, they won't last. And if you feel like you don't fit, well, you're not supposed to. Jesus Christ the scripture says in Colossians 1, 27, he is our hope of glory. If you're trying to find your hope down here, you'll never find it. It will lead to hopelessness. Jesus, our hope of glory. If you've never asked him to be your savior this morning, Go there this morning in prayer with me. Tell him you believe. Ask him to save you from your sin. And that very moment, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. And he will never leave you nor forsake you. If you came this morning feeling hopeless or just dried out, if within your spiritual life, you're seeing yourself maybe holding your ground, but that's about it, not being effective for the kingdom. If you feel dried out, Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Kindle afresh the gift of God. Let's be the army that the Lord wants us to be. I don't want to be a pastor of a church filled with dry bones. I got my own bones to deal with, okay? And my bones are aching. (laughs) Yeah. But my spirit's on fire. I think you got the message, church. I hope you've heard my heart. Kindle afresh the gift of God in you. Let's be an effective army for the kingdom. You go to prayer. And I'll close this in a couple minutes. Holy Spirit of God, breathe afresh on us. Life, I would pray, Lord Jesus. As Ezekiel prophesied to the nation of Israel, use your church here in Eagle, in Eagle Point to prophesy to the, to the city of Eagle Point and to our neighbors. Your word, by your spirit, breathe Holy Spirit afresh on us that we would be an effective army for your kingdom, that the fullness of the Gentiles would come in 
and you'd come for your church. Forgive us of being content and getting comfortable. May we be an army, a spiritual army that's on the move. An army that's known by name, an army of love, and an army that wants to bring unity. Bring revival, Lord, by your spirit. I pray you'd start it right here in Eagle Point. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We certainly serve an amazing God who can do incredible things. I guess, though, a God who could breathe life into the dust of the ground and create man could uh, raise up dry bones and put new life into them. So let's stand and worship that incredible God. From the highest of height to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of
Let's pray. Great God in heaven, we would add our praise and worship and our song to the rest of creation. Of those that are worshiping you around the world, of those that are worshiping you in the heavenlies right now, we give you our praise and our worship. Thank you that you've gone before us, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. And Lord, when you look in at the army here in Eagle Point, I just pray that you would find one that is filled with life, filled with the Spirit, an army that's courageous, an army that wants to build your kingdom. Use us this week, I pray. And may we remember, Lord Jesus, you're a God of the impossible, not generally speaking, but specifically speaking to our own personal circumstances. Come soon, Lord Jesus. In your name, amen. God bless you.